the CBO, which is nonpartisan, um, Congressional Budget uh, Office, has predicted that in the next 10 years, we're going to get an additional $20 trillion added to the $34 trillion of federal debt right now. And there's $100 trillion of baseline deficits going up to 2050. That at 5% interest rates, think about it. That is absolutely insane. It cannot be serviced. It's unsustainable and it's going to is going to eventually create a U.S. dollar crisis. Is the U.S. dollar about to see a crisis never before witnessed? Is the world seeing a rising tide of geopolitical tensions that may damage not just our portfolios, but perhaps challenge our safety and prosperity as more wars take front and center in global headlines? Let's discuss these themes along with what's happening recently with Bitcoin, gold, and the stock markets with our next guest, Canadian, businessman and philanthropist Frank Justra. Frank is the CEO of the Fiore Group, the founder of Alliance Gate Entertainment and the co-chair of the International Crisis Group. Uh, he is the founder and former director of Wheaton River, uh, later Gold Corp, and he's had a storied career building a number of successful mining companies, uh, a few of which we'll be talking about later on in the interview. He's also the recipient of Canada's highest civilian honor, the Order of Canada in 2019. Frank, welcome to the show. An honor to host you. Thanks for being here. Hey, David. It's great, great to be on again. Frank, this idea that the U.S. dollar's days as the sole reserve currency are numbered is an idea that's been passed around for quite some time. But the implications of this idea are what's most important for uh, people like uh, me uh, and investors like yourself. We want to know what this means for the world, because if the U.S. dollar is no longer the global reserve currency, could that also mean that the U.S. dollar is no longer the sole superpower? Could that mean there's going to be a rising uh, superpower to challenge the U.S.? Could there be more conflicts? Could there be more wars? That's what we're here to discuss today. So, Frank, let's start with the U.S. dollar. Do you think that it's losing its status as a reserve currency and a global hegemon? Yeah, they are. It's just a function or a question of how long it will take. And it may happen very gradually over a period of time, or it may happen with some event that creates a more sudden uh, switch to some other mechanism. But it's happening, and it's happening right in front of our eyes in many different ways. Um, the BRICS are driving this. China is leading the BRICS in this quest for a uh, reset of the global monetary system. They have been for quite a while. And since the Russia invasion of Ukraine has gathered a lot of steam as a result of the West's sanctions on Russian reserves and elimination from the Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, uh, settlement system. So um, the mechanisms are many and there are lots of other mechanisms that are being discussed. But in essence, what is happening is that the world at large, led again by China, by uh, Russia to some extent, are finding different mechanisms in which to conduct trade that is outside the US dollar system. And like I said, there, there are many, we can go through a laundry list of the, 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 the mechanisms that are being discussed, but what is actually being used at the moment while we're waiting for some new monetary system reset, uh, which is, would be something like what happened uh, with the uh, Bretton Woods system when it changed after World War II, we're heading towards a, a reset, but that may take time. In the meantime, most countries in, around the world are finding ways to trade using local currencies. And again, the laundry list is long and growing every day. Um, and it's mostly within the BRICS countries in the global south that these mechanisms are being put into place. So that takes away from the demand of US dollars. And this is happening at the same time as central banks around the world are de-dollarizing, selling their US dollar reserves, and in many cases buying gold. You know, gold has been accumulated on a very steady basis for the last 14 years. And, and now at an accelerating pace, central banks around the world are de-dollarizing and buying gold. And so all of these things will eventually become problematic for the United States because if the US loses its US dollar all, its supreme reserve status, which it has, it has a lot of repercussions on the yeah. US 
the economy in terms of standard of living, interest rates, inflation, all these things will impact, be impacted negatively. And um, so it's just a question of whether it happens gradually or suddenly. And, you know, but it's happening. OK, Frank, uh, I want to come back to some of those points. But first, you mentioned monetary reset several times. I've heard that term before. First of all, what does that word exactly mean to you? And second, why do we need a monetary reset? What's wrong with the current global monetary system today? Well, the, 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 it's, when you look at it from the perspective of the global south, for instance, OK, the U.S. dollar system is basically unfair to countries that have to import American inflation. So the U.S. exports its inflation to low-income countries with an overvalued dollar. And commodities, as you know, are mostly priced in U.S. dollars. So as, commodity, as the dollar is overpriced, commodity costs for low-income countries becomes excessive. Um, most sovereign debt around the world, especially in the global south, is priced in U.S. dollars. And they have to service that debt. So when you get an overpriced U.S. dollar, it becomes very expensive. And that's why the U.N. was begging the Fed to lower interest rates last year. And the Fed has stubbornly refused to do so up until, up until so now. The, the U.N. was begging the, the U.N. was begging the Fed. I didn't. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, the U.N. was begging the Fed on behalf of low income countries to lower interest rates. This is last year. And, you know, uh, the yeah. U.S. is doing what's good for the U.S. and doesn't really think much about the rest of the world. So so that sovereign debt has to be serviced in very expensive U.S. dollars. And then there's the fear of sanctions, you know, because when the U.S., the West led by the U.S., sanctioned Russia and froze its dollar reserves, eliminated right. it from the SWIFT settlement system, many countries around the world, you know, they don't have to be unfriendly to the U.S., but they're thinking, who's going to be next on the naughty list? If the U.S. deems you, like they've deemed Venezuela or Iran or Russia, uh, North Korea, to be the enemy, they will sanction you. And they could easily free, if you have U.S. dollars in your central bank reserves, they can freeze those dollars because they're in the form of treasury bills. And so that fear, and then additionally, the U.S. fiscal system is in really serious trouble. You know, you got... Two trillion dollar deficits every year, as far as as far as the eye can see, the CBO, which is nonpartisan um, Congressional Budget uh, Office, has predicted that in the next ten years we're going to get an additional twenty trillion dollars added to the thirty four trillion dollars of federal debt right now, and there's a hundred trillion dollar dollars of baseline deficits going up to twenty fifty. That at 5% interest rates, think about it. That is absolutely insane. It cannot be serviced. It's unsustainable, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to eventually create a U.S. dollar crisis. So for all of those reasons, the world wants a different system, a different monetary system. And again, China, which is an adversary to the U.S., has led this charge, but it's catching on. You know, Now you've got the BRICS with 11 members and 20 more applicants standing in line uh, and they're going to control most of the world's GDP at some point or a very large chunk of it. And they okay. want a different system. They're all begging for it. They've talked about a BRICS currency, which I think will take, it's, you know, it's not going to happen overnight and it's going to take a bunch of years. But in the meantime, you're going to get a mishmash of weekly dominant currencies basically competing with the U.S. dollar. And that's what's happening. Okay, well, let's talk about the uh, BRICS currency in just a bit. But first, speaking of the BRICS, they've recently announced. This is uh, an article from Fox Business, dated March third, uh, March fifth, rather. They've recently announced a new payment system away from the U.S. dollar. I'll just read you the headline and the first two paragraphs. Russia, China team up against the U.S. dollar with planned blockchain payment system. It says here the BRICS block of countries led by China and Russia are moving ahead with their efforts to move away from the U.S. dollar with an announcement that they're planning to create a payment system based on blockchain. The five-nation BRICS group um, uh, told uh, a uh, Russian agency, uh, TASS, late Monday, we believe that creating an independent BRICS payment system is an important goal for the future, which could be based on state-of-the-art tools such as digital technologies and blockchain. So first, evaluate why they're doing this uh, and talk about what, whether or not you think blockchain is a solution to what they're trying to achieve here. 
Well, what they're referring to is central bank digital currencies as a means of settlement on trades between countries, okay? And um, that is a reality. There's probably 130 countries around the world that are testing central bank digital currencies. And I don't know if you've heard of the M Bridge project between China, Thailand, and the UAE, which has been in effect for the last couple yeah. of years, which is testing cross-border settlements using central bank to central bank ledgers and completely outside the US dollar system. So this is what they're referring to. And it's more efficient, it's gonna be less expensive, and it removes the, you know, a, a large part of the world from the, uh, what they perceive to be a problematic US dollar system. So yes, that's absolutely happening. And it makes sense if you're, if you're one of these countries, if you're Saudi Arabia, if you're Turkey, if you're Egypt, if you're Nigeria, uh, Venezuela, it makes sense to have a system that's more efficient and less costly and is not going to be in jeopardy of being attacked by the U.S. government. Right. But if they do this, Frank, uh, if they go ahead with not just a CBDC, but a common BRICS currency, an idea that's been talked about a lot, what does that look like? Well, I, we don't know yet. And, I, and again, I think the, the idea of a BRICS currency, like a euro, for instance, yeah. is a long ways down the road because, you know, you've got a number of countries that uh, within the BRICS group that are adversaries, India and China being the prime example. Um, and so I don't know whether they're going to, you know, it, it, I think it'll happen eventually. I think it'll take time. Uh, and in the meantime, you're getting these bilateral arrangements between countries to trade in their local currencies. And that's going to, and that can move to a digital world quite easily. And that's what's going to happen, I think, first. And then I think that gold is going to play some role mm -hmm. in whatever this new system is going to look like. And uh, that will, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see how that plays out. But there's a very good reason why all the central banks around the world have been absolutely piling up their gold reserves. I mean, it's, it's again, they broke a record uh, in 2022. 2023 was almost equal to 2022. And there's still, if you look at the uh, January and February numbers of 2024, central banks led by China again, are really buying up all the physical gold. Gold is moving from the West, physical gold is moving from the West to the East. And it's happening right in front of our eyes and hardly anybody in America is paying attention. Are central banks price sensitive? In other words, will they typically buy gold when they believe it's at a fair value? Well, David, you know, think about it. They've been steadily buying gold for 14 years, since 2010. They haven't wavered. And the price has gone from, you know, from since 2010, it's had a low of 1100 and a high of today. It, it just hit 2200 today. Okay, they, they keep buying. So, so thus far, they haven't been sensitive to the price. But you, so you don't think this is an indicator of higher prices just because central banks are moving in? Investors shouldn't look at it that way? Well, and I think investors need to pay attention to what central banks are doing. They're, they're in the know. They know what's going on. They're seeing what's happening around the world. I think investors in, in North America are, are not paying attention. They're too focused on, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and they're not paying attention to what's happening in the real monetary world. And so I think that uh, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense to pay very close attention to what central banks are doing. Let's talk about the petrol dollar now, the idea that uh, somewhere down the line, uh, oil will no longer be denominated in U.S. dollars, or at least there might be a bifurcation in our global uh, system whereby we have your oil priced in dollars and oil priced in something else. Is that what's going to happen next, Frank? It, yeah, it's already it's already starting to happen. And I think, you know, Saudi Arabia is the key player in this in this game of uh, maintaining the petrodollar status. And even Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has toyed with the idea and said it publicly that they would consider, consider selling oil and, and yuans. Uh, many other countries, including the UAE, <laughs> is trading oil in other currencies outside the US dollar. They're already doing it with India and Durham's. Um, these oil trades are happening um, in other currencies. Ghana has said they will sell, they will use gold to buy oil instead of U.S. dollars. Um, so it is happening. 
the 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 tricky part, I think, and is and, and again, Saudi Arabia is the key player in OPEC, and I think from their perspective, they have to walk a very delicate balance between their relationship with China on one hand and the U.S. on the other. You know, they have security arrangements with the United States, but they see China as the future in terms of where their trade is going to come from, and they have an arrangement with China to to uh, to sell oil and 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 China will invest in Saudi Arabia in other things. So I think that the days of the petrodollar are numbered. But again, you know, countries are have to be very careful not to upset the United States by completely abandoning the petrodollar because that would be a national security issue for the United States. And they would react very violently, in my opinion, if that were to happen. So what's happening in the world and the way you have to look at it is that China is promoting the idea. For, for many years, the U.S. promoted the idea to the world. Um, we will uh, buy your oil and sell you arms. OK, that was the arrangement. Basically, with a large, we'll keep you safe, the world. You know, we have the largest Navy in the world. We'll keep the waterways safe. Uh, we'll sell you arms and you sell us your oil and you do it in U.S. dollars, okay? Uh, you have to use the U.S. dollar. That was always the case. China has a different sales pitch. They say, we'll give you prosperity. We'll buy your oil and invest in your country and your development. It's oil for development instead of oil for arms. And that is selling very well with a large part of the world, because China, as you know, with its Belt and Road Initiative, is invest has invested very heavily around the world uh, in development, uh, in and in many cases in order to secure energy and mineral needs. Um, and so, you know, when you think at, about it from the perspective of a lot of the world, the BRICS, the global South, you know, oil for prosperity makes makes a lot more sense than oil for arms and so this is this is going to be the battle going you know as we move forward is the u.s selling one idea and china selling another Here, here's the thing a lot of people agree with you frank that there's going to be a bifurcation of global strength and power and monetary systems and whatnot but are are we ready for another superpower to take over. Let's just take up, uh, talk about the global Belt and Road, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, by the way, which has been criticized as a loan shark, Chinese loan shark problem. A lot of the African countries that China is building in can't even pay back the loans that China is giving them. And so they're paying them back in other ways by basically being imperialized, right? That's one criticism. Uh, and, you know, and that is a bogus claim when you think about it. Now, listen, Ch Ch China is doing what's good for China, as every other country yeah. in the world does the same. But the idea that uh, this is uh, uh, debt diplomacy by China to uh, basically enslave countries through this unpayable debt is bogus. And you have to, there was a Bloomberg article on this last year that you should look up, which it basically said, you know, it, 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 and, and if you look at it, what, what, take Africa, for instance. Africa, where, where China is very heavily invested. It has strategic partnerships with 44 countries in Africa, including not, its space programs with nine countries in Africa. It's invested $1.3 trillion in various, in about 20,000 projects. And when you look at it, and it's, and these are government to government deals, which many countries on the, around the world prefer rather than dealing with corporations. And if you look at it from the African country's perspective, they, they're not complaining. They're not the ones that are complaining. It's the West that is labeling um, these loans as unpayable and unfair and whatever. And when, when you look at what the IMF has done to a lot of these countries over the years, you know, it's, you know, it's really a bit of the kettle calling the pot black, you know. And, but it's, it's a competition. You have to understand this is a global competition for global supremacy. China is going to is on its way to become the number one economy in the world. It already isn't, and the U.S. doesn't like it. And the U.S. is reacting, and it's no different than what's happened throughout history. And the patterns are all the same. So I think that the idea that China's loans and arrangements with countries around the world have been labeled as totally unfair 
is completely yeah. wrong. It's bogus. I mean, you have to just get real about what's, what's going on and compete. The U.S. has to compete instead of complain. <laughs> I, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but the, the the antithesis to what you've been what we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes is that there's no there's no de-dollarization trend. Frank, I mean, look at the DXY. It's it, it's been on an uptrend for the last couple of years uh, relative mm -hmm. to other currencies. It's relatively strong. And now on the on the subject of the BRICS taking over the U.S., China has its own economic problems. It's, it's got a housing bubble that's already collapsing. Uh, we don't even know if it's going to become the world's largest economy and sustain that level. Russia's got problems of its own that you know are obvious. The U.S. is doing quite well relative to the other peers, right? That's 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 the counter argument here. We don't need to worry if we're in the West. Okay, I mean, you want me to respond, respond to that? Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, listen. First of all, when you compare currencies with other currencies, it's an abstraction. You know, it's it's an illusion. You, you can't, that's not the way to measure the value of a currency. So when you say that the U.S. dollar strength has been consistent for the last few years, yeah, because the U.S. jacked up its interest rates to 5% uh, and has led the world in terms of interest rate hikes, and that attracts investment, like treasury bills, investments, and that's all fine. But you have to measure, the only true measure of currencies is a currency against measured against gold. OK, and that's what you have to keep an eye on. And up until recently, you know, that wasn't yeah. really evident, but now it's starting to become evident now. And when you say that the U.S. is doing well, really? I said relative to its peers, right? I mean, it's got everyone's got no, no, problems. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. But, excuse, yeah, yes. It's, its economy has been stronger than some of the rest. But right. at what cost? At what cost? Hi. How can you say that the economy is strong when it's fueled by government debt to the tune of $2 trillion a year deficits? That's not strength. That's an illusion. And one day it's going to come back and bite it. And so you have to look at the reality of what's going on in the world as opposed to what is being promoted as economic strength. And so I, I don't believe that the U.S. economy is as strong as they would like to to, to have you believe, and you, can, you just got to look at their fiscal situation. It's an, it's very problematic. Those are very, very big numbers. You, you mentioned gold may be the solution to these problems. You actually tweeted about this recently. You criticized a CNBC article. You said when CNBC misleads its audience by cautioning them against buying gold, it's time to actually pay attention. I'll just cite a few uh, quotes from this particular article here. It says, uh, first of all, uh, don't be enticed by the gold rally. Investors buy gold and hope it doesn't go go up. Uh, one helpful way to think about the recent gold rally, it's a case of schadenfreude. The yellow metal does, does well when other assets in the world are in trouble. And then it goes on to list a few reasons why gold has not been a good investment over time. Despite brief rallies, the average return, annual return for gold, uh, far legs stocks and bonds, according to experts. So it's really just a safety play that doesn't really last is what this article is saying. Yeah. So David, and they use their measure and again, you yeah. can play all sorts of silly games with statistics, okay? So, well, from 2014, uh, the S&P outperformed gold. To the, hey, listen, I'll give you two other statistics. Since the turn of the century, since 2001, gold has outperformed stocks and bonds. Since 1971 to the present, gold has outperformed, uh, gold has gone up 5,700%. The Dow Jones, Dow Jones has gone up 4,500%. The CNBCs of the world are really shells for Wall Street. You, you listen, I, I've, CNBC will never promote gold. They never have and they never will because it's, it's, it's a counter argument to the, the narrative that they're putting to the public that everything's fine. You have to invest in stocks and in bonds and cryptocurrency. Anything that generates fees for Wall Street and creates wealth, wealth for Wall Street is what CNBCs of the world like to promote. And the fact that gold has outperformed everything else over time, they don't, they don't like to admit that because they would be admitting that gold has a true role in protecting wealth. Um, and so I don't, I don't buy any of this stuff. And in the meantime, in the same day they came out with that article, David, yeah, they put out another article that Bitcoin could possibly go to $98,000 a coin, you know, when it's trading at 60 something. So they promote things that Wall Street makes money off of, right. and they, they, they poo-poo gold. So I don't, I don't trust CNBC. 
I, they're, <laughs> I, I think that, that, you know, Jim Cramer, oh my God, the guy's never right. And I don't even know why he has a following. It just, it's, it, it's all entertainment, it's a show, and none of it makes any sense to me. Listen to this sentence from the same article. Should investors take part in the doomsday holding? Okay, it's calling gold a literal doomsday holding. Can you evaluate that uh, that term? Is it cor is it correct? It's it's true. Gold is sort of a hedge against almost every other stupidity in the world. It always has been, and so uh, the the question of whether you should be um, what what that sentence is insinuating is should should you be rooting for a doomsday? And again, I'm going to say to you. It doesn't matter what you're rooting for. The question is, should you be putting your money into something that will protect you in the event of an unraveling? Well, that's, well, you know, that's, that's the question. And so it's not about what you're rooting for, it's about being realistic. Well, here's the thing, uh, Frank. Gold currently, as we're speaking today on Friday, 2185, right? Already past all-time highs. Bitcoin briefly surpassed all-time highs very briefly. Uh, the S&P, uh, Dow Jones already broke all-time highs weeks ago. I think all these assets are probably responding to another four, something else that's going on because you've got risk assets and gold, which is a safety play, all going up at the same time, right? What's going on? Yeah. Well, that's probably the best question you've asked today because the answer is I don't, I don't know. And I'm telling you, and don't listen to all the talking heads that are trying to explain this recent gold rally. This recent gold rally that's happened this past week is very different. There's something going on. And we're not going to learn the reason for this rally because it seems to be uninterrupted. The manipulators that are usually in the market have stepped out of the way. There's something going on that will be explained later because who, whatever the powers that are driving this gold price are up to, they don't, they're not going to let you know that until they've accomplished what they need to accomplish. This is a very different gold rally. It's happening without any explanation, and, and and it's not about what Powell said the other day or about interest rates. About it's not about the dollar. There's something going on that's very profound, and I don't have the answer. I can, I, I can speculate, and there could be a, a whole bunch of reasons. But this rally is extremely different. And I've been watching gold my entire adult life. And what's happened this, this last week is unexplainable. It's not, it's very different than every other rally that I've ever seen. And it's happening almost at an uninterrupted pace, marching its way forward a couple hundred bucks an ounce, and no one can explain it. And I, my guess is we'll find out down the road what happened. <laughs> but it, 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 I'm, I'm certain it involves geopolitical players okay so it's not we'll, we'll, we'll finish off here and then I want it's to certainly i'll tell you what it's not it's not yeah. investors this is not a gold rally that's being driven by because if you see what's happening with the gold etfs we're actually getting outflows of etf money in the gold etfs during a spike in gold so it's investors and certainly not in north america they're not the ones that are doing this my yeah, guess well, is yeah. that there are central banks involved in this rally. That's all I can guess. This is not an investor-driven rally. This is a geo. This is a geopolitical player rally, and it's most likely central banks somewhere, one or a, a number of them acting in concert. Who knows? Well, we we know what gold reacts to geopolitical risks. The dollar. The dollar has not been you know. Exposed going down or exploding has just been flat the dxy so it's not really reacting to the dollar inflation hasn't been you know inflation hasn't been skyrocketing gold hedges against inflation so that's not that uh we talked about the fed the fed has announced that it's going to lower rates at some point but you said it's not an interest rate thing so the only variable left that i mentioned is geopolitical risks right do you see a war or conflict breaking out is that what's that the gold market is pricing in yeah, I think that's part of it, but I don't think that's the reason for the re recent rally what okay. we've seen the last week. I think that there's part of it. Yeah, yeah, the world's very fragile at the moment. You've got two major wars going on, each of which could trigger the involvement of global powers into a direct conflict. Both of those wars, Gaza and Ukraine, have the, and then there's Taiwan and China. Um, all of these 
conflicts and brewing conflicts have the potential of creating a global war. Mm -hmm. And so that's, but that's been, that's, that risk has been there for a couple of years already. Uh, that's not the reason this rally happened. Okay. I think there's something else going on. Okay. We'll find out what it is. We'll follow up. Perhaps you'll write another article in the Toronto Sun or somewhere else and uh, we'll, we'll read about it there. Uh, Frank, Frank, let's talk about some of your recent holdings. But before that, why aren't you retired? Why? Why? What? Why, why aren't you retired? Why, why are you still working so hard? What are you trying to achieve now? Yeah. People, people die when they retire. Okay. I will never retire. I think that's a, that's a death sentence. And I, and I mean that. I think that you have to keep your brain active. You have to be involved in things, doing things. And you will live longer and have a healthier lifespan if you do that as opposed to retiring. So I will never retire. I go way too much on my plate. As you know, most of my world is my philanthropic work. I 80% of my time is on my foundations and working with Crisis Group as co-chair there. Um, but um, I like the mining business. I, I grew up with it. I've made all my wealth from it. Uh, and I still enjoy it. I enjoy, I've staffed up my office with, you know, a couple of dozen of geologists and engineers and corporate finance people, because I see a market coming, not only in gold, but in the battery metals, which I think we're going to see a huge deficit of supply over the next 15, 20 years. And that's going to be much higher prices for, for the metals. Um, so my, 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 my expertise in business is in mining and I love it. I absolutely love it. I love creating companies. I've created many, many mining companies throughout my career, and I will continue to do so. I enjoy it. Uh, the two projects I want to bring up that you're involved with, Eris Gold, West Red Lake Gold, right? Why have you selected mm -hmm. to partner with these projects here? Eris is, 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 is uh, a gold producer in Colombia, mostly in Colombia. Uh, we have two producing mines down there. Uh, we just came out our, with our numbers yesterday, um, and very impressive. You got 250,000 ounces a year of gold production going to 500,000 ounces by 2026, um, just on our currently fully financed and permitted projects. Plus we have another massive project, Soto Norte, which uh, is going through the permitting phase. Uh, and our ambition is to be a million ounce a year producer and we'll get there. You know, I think we have a pathway to get there. Um, now here's the disconnect. And it's not just Eris, by the way, although Eris is at the extreme in terms of valuations. I've never in my 45 year career seen such a disconnect between the price of gold and the price of the gold mining equities that mine the gold. It's like gold's going up dramatically, but the gold mining stocks are barely moving. And so yeah. you've got Eris with the numbers I just gave you. They, they had $156 million US EBITDA, 156 million US in EBITDA, it's got a $450 million market cap. And, you know, in, in my career, I've never seen anything like that. And there, I've got other gold mining positions that are equally undervalued. And I think that that's gonna, as gold now maintains its uh, all time high and goes higher, I think that sentiment will change, but I'm surprised it hasn't changed yet. I gotta be honest with you. I think this is, it's, it's a weird, bizarre universe we're living in right now where this disconnect exists but so that's eris and so eris you know is uh, i this is my fifth gold mining company i've created in the last 20 years and uh you know we as always we have a three to seven year time horizon where we try and create a million ounce year producer we've done it before and it will create wealth uh for its shareholders over over time and it's incredibly undervalued i've mean, never seen anything like it and the, and the numbers speak for themselves not not promoting it just is but again we're not alone you know i have friends that have other mining companies that are suffering, that are suffering the same could, could, could i just suggest a theory as to why there's this disconnect well it, it just it, it's from this it's from the tech sector right i mean the, the speculative money has flowed into this new hot trend of ai and everything with it that's true tech sector so, you know, the, the Magnificent Seven, Bitcoin, with all of these Bitcoin ETFs, that's stealing a lot of the thunder from, and again, these are North American investors, okay? <laughs> the physical gold's been bought all in the East, and so that's happening, but, but certainly investors here are distracted by, you know, this easy money that's being made in tech stocks and, 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 and cryptocurrencies. 
you're, you're, you're a major shareholder of West Red Lake Gold. So Eris is producing, West Red Lake is not. What's your thesis behind holding? First of all, before we're talking about the project itself, what's your reason for holding a, a junior mining project that isn't, isn't producing right now? It's a great opportunity. And so we bought, I don't know how much you know about West Red Lake, but it was, we bought it out of bankruptcy. It was a fully built mine, fully permitted, with a couple of million ounces in the ground that the previous management messed up. Being quite honest, they just messed it up. Too much debt, too much in a rush, made too many mistakes, and it went into bankruptcy. And we bought it for a very low price um, uh, last year. And our job is now to do what previous management should should have done, which is to put it into production in a in a responsible manner. It will go back into production in the next sort of 12, 18 months. And so the upside, when it, you know, it's got a current market cap of say $130 million. Um, and I've already raised uh, close to $70 million in the last year to do the work that was necessary to put it back into production in a way that it will produce gold very profitably. Yeah. Um, if we achieve the goal of putting it back in production as I expect we will, the upside is tremendous. This, this company that owned it before had a $1.2 billion market cap at some point based on this mine. Okay. So I look at it as a risk reward and we put together an, an exceptional mining team that knows what they're doing with underground mining and knows they can put it back in production. Those were the mistakes were made and there were mistakes that shouldn't have been made. They were like, you know, just basic mistakes they were in a rush to put it into production. They wanted to sell the company and they messed it up. It's as simple, it's as, simple as that. Well, why, why, well, I mean, why, yeah, but that's, that's a difference of strategy, right? I mean, why, why would you want, why would you as a shareholder want to go into production as opposed to just selling it off and not dealing with the cap? Oh, the I see. Because yeah, of... no, like with everything else I've created, I have a plan, you know, my, all the mining companies I've created since Gold Corp, Endeavor Mining, uh, Leia Gold, Eris and now West Red Lake have a plan. The plan is very simple. It's called a buy and build strategy. So you start with one mine. All these companies started with one mine. And then through a series of efforts, including M&A, including buying projects and putting them in production, you build a gold mining company with multiple mines. And that's where the wealth is created. And I've proven it in the past. It's, <laughs> it's worked very well. It's a formula that works very well. So West Red Lake, much like Eris, the plan, my plan is Canadian. Okay, so it's a Canadian mine. We'll put it back into production, but there will be other things attached to it, either through M&A or through putting other projects into production. My objective, to build a Canadian gold mining company that will produce many hundreds of thousands of ounces a year. And that's how I do it. And like I said, done it before. There's no guarantee of success, but it's what we do best. Hey, do, do, do you have a, 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 a last question on mining? We'll end it here. Do you, do you have an approach to picking projects? I mean, West Red Lake, for example, is a, it's a brownfield exploration project. Okay? There's, it's a long history behind that particular deposit. Do you, is, that, is that something you go for? Something that already has had a history of mining? Or, do you, or is there better value, you think, in picking something that's greenfield? Uh, green fields are tough, okay. And you know, I've, I've I've invested a bit in green fields. It's a very very risky business. Um, I've made money and lost money doing it, but it it doesn't fit the formula of what I just described. To have to to achieve what I achieve and have achieved in all my mining companies, you start with something that is either already in production and can be improved upon or something that's ready to go into production and needs capital and, and management expertise to get there, okay? Greenfield stuff, that's a different game. That's a completely different game. You can make a lot of money on that and lose a lot of money on that. What I do has a lot less risk. Okay, perfect. Final question. Uh, I want to get your take on the future of media. You also founded Lionsgate Entertainment. Uh, love the work that that company has done, by the way. Um, you've you've had uh, back and forth between uh, Twitter. Uh, you know, you criticize Twitter for what they've done. Now, what is the future of how people consume media? Is it social media? Is it online? Is there still room for cable TV? Uh, are you still venturing in the media space? What's the future here? I'm not. Um, I you know that's that that was my past. 
Um, but the way I see it is that uh, it, we live in a world of information where information is, uh, is the most important commodity. And the problem we have today is a mistrust in information, okay? Mistrust with the mainstream media, uh, mistrust with social media. Uh, social media is largely unregulated, so you can, you know, and now with the uh, introduction of artificial intelligence, it's getting really scary because who's going to determine and how do you determine when information is true and what is false, what is misleading, what is meant to mislead you. Uh, and that's a very scary world to live in. And I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I see nothing but problems with the way that the media works in and the, and the lack of trust in media. People are believing things that they are told because they live in echo chambers, both with respect to the mainstream media. So you got Fox, you got CNN, or Fox and MSNBC, two separate universes there, yeah. giving different information to their viewers. And then you got social media that does the same thing. You know, you've got all sorts of uh, narratives being promoted on social media and much of it is complete misinformation and disinformation. Well, you've been and, the subject of some of these attacks, right? On, on social media, on Twitter? Okay. Yeah, that's why I sued Twitter. I sued Twitter several years ago. It was a you know, bit of a bold move, but I sued them for, and I sued them for a dollar. I didn't sue them to <laughs> make money. I sued them to make a point. And the point was that I was getting death threats on lies that were being told by the QAnon crowd through Twitter, and yeah. I complained, and I, you know, I, you know, I wrote letters to Jack Dorsey, and I said, you know, and got zero response. So I thought, okay, I'll get their attention. So I sued them. And now I can't talk about the settlement because we signed an NDA. But um, you know, I, I was, I was making a point, I was saying, change your ways. You, you can't tackle this misinformation. You can't tackle when these bots are manipulating information. You can tackle death threats. You know, they weren't doing it before. No, you know, they well, changed e Elon Musk is doing the exact opposite. He's actually fired a majority of the team that's been responsible for censoring, quote, what he calls it, censoring content. When we just call it the moderation, he calls it censoring. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's not that's that's not really the future that the current owner is wanting to take. I don't think he agrees with you there, Frank. He, he doesn't. And, and that's fine. You know, that, that, that's his take on it. I have to make a point about what sure. was happening before. And death threats are unacceptable. Sure. You know, just unacceptable. Because we live in a crazy world. And some people believe these crazy stories about Pizzagate and, you know, Hollywood people drinking the blood of children. I mean, there are people that believe this stuff and they want to do something about it. And there's already been cases where people that are not quite stable go out with guns and try and 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 be the vigilantes that fix this problem. You know, yeah. it's, cra it's a crazy world out there. So, you know, the, the media has a responsibility. And a lot of times the media does not take on that responsibility of not firing up, you know, a, a population with lies that makes them react. Mm -hmm. Frank, where do we learn more about you and the uh, Fury Group and what you're working on with these days? What do you mean, where do we learn more? Is there, is there some place we can follow you? Uh, oh, Twitter. Listen, Twitter is my, my, you know, even though I sued Twitter, I'm still on it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, no, but like, like, again, I was making a point. I made the point. Yeah. That's behind us now. Um, sure. But Twitter is where I express my views about everything from geopolitics, from conflicts, to macroeconomics, to the dollar, to gold. Any, anything that I feel where the world, where there's an injustice taking place, and I comment on so many things. I write about lots and lots of stuff, including, you know, you know, just just go there. You'll find everything I've written gets posted there. All my opinions, and everything. <laughs> day to day, I will see an article on something, and I'll opine on it and say, you know, this is where I believe it's right or wrong, and uh, and I point out things that a lot of people don't pay attention to, and okay. I enjoy it, and it's my it's my platform. 
Okay, you, you haven't considered, final question, I'll let you go. You haven't considered launching your own social media platform, taking the Donald Trump route? <laughs> Why would I do that? What kind of an audience would I have? <laughs> Seriously. I, I don't know. Yeah, no. Well, I, not, I, I'm happy to use somebody else's platform. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your time today, Frank. We've learned a lot. David, always my pleasure. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.